Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to probably the last Elasticsearch meetup of the year, unless um, someone volunteers to do a talk for December. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Big thank you for Yelp for hosting us again. It's a fantastic um, venue, and they've got a fantastic search team who tonight are going to present some, uh, some some of the tech, some of some of the work that they, 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 they they've been doing here at Yelp. Um, I'm sure you don't want to listen to me talk and all night, so I'm going to introduce you to Krishna from Yelp, who will tell you about Yelp, this, introduce the speakers, and the uh, top topic for tonight. Krishna. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out. Um, so <clears throat> the topic for today's uh, meetup is Yelp's Elasticsearch-based ranking platform. Specifically, we'll be talking about um, the self-serve indexing system that we kind of uh, developed recently, as well as uh, a gatekeeper uh, and some of the defense mechanisms that uh, we built out into this platform. So before we get started, just a quick note about um, Yelp's mission, which is to connect people with great local businesses. So uh, to give you uh, an idea of uh, the scale at which Yelp operates, uh, we have nearly 200 million reviews as of September 2019. Um, the monthly average of unique visitors to Yelp um, was 37 million via the Yelp app and 77 million via mobile web in Q2. Um, search is a very critical functionality to Yelp, and uh, how do some of those uh, business metrics translate to uh, Yelp search? Uh, so we use Elasticsearch pretty extensively, and we have millions of documents indexed in our Elasticsearch clusters across different ecosystems. Um, we serve hundreds of millions of search queries every day, and we support real-time indexing in the uh, real-time indexing delay in the order of minutes. <laughs> so, uh, Elasticsearch, like I mentioned, we use Elasticsearch very extensively. So, just to give you an idea of some of the use cases uh, that we support, so um, the first screenshot is uh, the Yelp score search experience. So, if you go to Yelp, type in some free text and a geo box, uh, the ordered ranking of the results that you see is powered by Elasticsearch. Uh, on this page, we also have like ad content uh, and ensuring the relevance of the ads that you see. That's also powered by Elasticsearch. Uh, Yelp also offers uh, the ability for you to submit quotes via request to quote product. Uh, so this is for things like home and local services. So in this case, uh, if you were to submit a quote for <coughs> a plumbing request, uh, we can you can allow we allow you the ability to kind of uh, get quotes from multiple businesses, and that recommendation system is powered by Elasticsearch. Uh, and finally, uh, the screenshot towards the most right is uh, like kind of a free uh, full text search application, which is uh, review search on our biz page. So if you're looking for just the right chicken tikka masala, you can basically like look for um, like mentions of that in reviews. Um, so this is just like a quick snippet. We host uh, we use Elasticsearch for a host of other applications, uh, but this kind of gives you um, a high level idea. So uh, before we get started into today's talks themselves, uh, just wanted to kind of take a moment to talk, to, uh, like take a step back and talk about why we decided to invest in a Elasticsearch-based ranking platform. So we talked a little bit about this in uh, a meetup that we had hosted like a few months ago, but uh, just wanted to like quickly go over that. So before we, uh, before our Elasticsearch-based system was developed, um, <clears throat> we the search the search backend was powered by a uh, Lucene system, which had uh, S3 as the primary data store, backed by the primary data store. So uh, we faced a few challenges with that system, uh, which uh, essentially meant that we want we wanted to like look for how we can address some of these. So <clears throat> the first one uh, being delayed indexing. So we didn't have support for real-time indexing. Uh, and we were indexing freshness was essentially bounded by how frequently we load these indices that were in S3. Um, we uh, had a lot of operational burden that came with the system. Uh, and uh, the lack of a generic query DSL like what Elasticsearch offers means that it was really hard for us to iterate quickly and push out new features. Uh, this meant that like the system was also not extensible to some of the other applications that uh, ranking applications that we had it um, uh, had that we wanted to support. Um, and then that meant that we had slightly divergent infrastructure and uh, the different ranking use cases were using slightly different infra. <clears throat> so it made a lot of sense for us uh, to invest in a common infrastructure and a platform uh, that would abstract away a lot of this complexity and uh, instead like offer a generic platform to host a lot of these search and ranking applications. So Elastic, and like I just want to call it like Elasticsearch being like the foundational layer to this, it was very pivotal. 
Um, so over the past few months, uh, like we've focused on building a lot of the interfaces uh, to uh, around like how we ingest data into our Anki platform. So it's like a self-serve indexing API, which will be one of the focus of the talks today. Uh, as well as interfaces to recall documents and also apply machine learning to Elasticsearch for relevance ranking. Uh, so with this, we were able to abstract away a lot of these infrastructural components and scale our ranking platform uh, to not only infrastructurally, but also to other teams and other use cases. So uh, the agenda for today's talks are, uh, so the first talk will be about like the self-serve ingestion platform, which uh, Tao Yu, who's a software engineer at Yelp, will be talking about. And then we'll also be talking about uh, the Elasticsearch, an Elasticsearch gatekeeper that was developed uh, to kind of safeguard and improve the resiliency of Elasticsearch. Uh, Karthik will be covering that. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Tao, who will uh, take it from here. Thanks, Krishna. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tao Yu from Yelp Ranking Platform team. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about our Elasticsearch indexing platforms we built at Yelp. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about our uh, requirements for our indexing system. Uh, uh, first, near real-time indexing and optimal indexing load of the Elasticsearch cluster, optimal sources, and frequent backfills. I will cover uh, them one by one in the next slides. Uh, as Christian mentioned, we use uh, Elasticsearch as one of our primary search engines here. So we use it to serve our primary search queries. So a lot of our data are quite sensitive to the time of the searches. For example, our reservation. At Yelp, you are able to, be, you are able to uh, search, based on search reservations based on which time you want to make the reservation. So in this case, if our data are not fresh enough, the search result will be pretty bad, and you, the reservation may already be booked by some other people, but you, the search result is still here, and uh, ask, say you can't make the reservation for this business. So this is our first requirement, then. We need to make sure our data is fresh enough. The data need to be indexed within minutes to avoid this, to provide good user, user experience. Uh, second thing is the optimal uh, indexing load of the Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, as but some of our cluster, as Christian mentioned, can be both read and write since it, uh, intensive. Uh, we, our, docu we have, our cluster have many millions of documents in the cluster, and also our QPS can be many thousands. So this, in this case, uh, we need to make sure the cluster load of our, the load of our ESH cluster should be optimal. And uh, as you may have known, indexing could use a lot of res resources of our Elasticsearch cluster. The default Elasticsearch red, red pool can be the number of cores plus one, which means for a default cluster, if you don't touch any config and you just try to index it as fast as possible, it can just use all of your CPUs and your query experience will be really bad. Uh, the third thing is multiple sources, and uh, this is pretty common, I guess. The Elasticsearch data might come from multiple sources instead of a single source. Uh, for example, our business data, it might have many hundreds of fields in the data, and some of the fields, like location, like uh, name of the business, they might come from our primary MySQL database. However, there might be some other fields, like click-through rate, which are generated from our user logs, and these logs are derived from our, are, gener are calculated by our Spark batches. So it's not from MySQL at all. So, and also there might be some data sources come from our partner data with also different sources. Uh, for the different multiple sources, our, uh, to support the multiple sources, the obvious solution we have is to use the Elasticsearch, up, uh, Elasticsearch Update API. However, we have seen a lot of issues with using the Elasticsearch Update API. And uh, as you have known, the Elasticsearch uses Lucene as the internal implementation. And the, the Lucene segments are actually immutable. So during an update request, it did three things. It first read the document from the Elasticsearch, update the relevant field of the Elasticsearch, and uh, write back the, with the newer version. This is Basically, this is essentially a read before write behavior. And uh, we did some benchmark uh, on our test cluster. 
we see a significant slowdown in both in ES6 and ES5 in our test cluster. We tested with a box size of 1,000 documents, and uh, each document is from a few hundred megabytes to uh, kilobytes. So this can be really a, a big issue during the burst indexing when we are indexing our like signals from generated from spark back, spark drops. And another thing is this. Uh, update requests require us to always enable the source field in our Elasticsearch index. This is not not always the case we want. We sometimes we want to disable the source field to save disk I/O or disk uh, or disk space. And uh, the last thing for our requirements is the uh, frequent backfills. Uh, first, we need backfills at the worst case recovery. That's pretty obvious. And we already we also have the S3 snapshot restart. Uh, set up. Uh, the second thing is major cluster version upgrade. For example, if we want to upgrade from ES5 to ES6, there is like major Lucene version change, and we cannot do a snapshot restore. We have to backfill from our sources. A third thing is changing uh, cluster configuration. For example, changing the sharding. As our data of the cluster keep growing, it's pretty common we want to increase the number of shards of our indexes. So to to support this, we also need to do a full backfill of our cluster. And also, we, if we are trying to make the text analysis in Elasticsearch, you are able to write your own analyzer or losing similarity in your, uh, for your cluster. And uh, we did that in, uh, for our clusters. And if you want to make modifications to your uh, customized uh, analyzer and the losing similarity, you have to do a full backfill as well. So to solve all this problem, we come up with our initial design. We use uh, Cassandra as a materialized view be, uh, in front of the Elasticsearch Index. So we have our sources here. It might be a Kafka topic. It might be a MySQL uh, database. It might be some S3 data generated from uh, Spark jobs. So for all these sources, we first write to Cassandra. Uh, we do send a lot of partial updates to Cassandra for the relevant fields. And then the sources also send the document IDs, we just changed to a Kafka queue. We have our customized index, we have our own indexer, which tells our Kafka topics and the query Cassandra to build the complete documents and then index to Elasticsearch. For this case, it solves our uh, update problem because we only update the Cassandra instead of the Elasticsearch directly. And we build the complete document from the Cassandra in the indexer. Uh, and this also solves our quick backfill problem, because during backfill, we just do a full refresh of our Cassandra table. Uh, yeah, as I just said, here we use the Cassandra as a source of truth, and all the partial, update, partial updates of the sources goes to the Cassandra first. And uh, we, our indexer will build the, the complete document, and we use bulk indexing to faster index to ES. Uh, however, we have seen a lot of challenges with the previous pipeline. As you have seen, uh, we there are three components in the previous Cassandra-based indexing pipeline. Uh, first, every uh, Cassandra table, uh, Kafka topic, and the indexer. This means every Indexing pipeline requires its own Cassandra table, its own Kafka topic, and its own setup of the indexer. This is introduced excessive complexity to launch, modify, or decommission an indexing pipeline. And this makes it really hard to, to be used as a general platform for multiple teams and multiple platforms. So to solve this problem, we come up with our new design, which is our current fancy Flink-based system. Here, we replace the uh, uh, Cassandra, Kafka, and uh, our custom indexer with a single Flink app. And uh, one thing you may notice is that our sources change here. Before, our sources are, can be Cassandra, can be, can, can be MySQL, can be Kafka, can be S3. It can be generally any, everything. But now, all the data sources change to Kafka. This, this is because of our data pipeline. So when we are investigating our uh, 
Elasticsearch indexing system, there are things changing in the company. We, we build our internal Yelp data pipeline here. This data pipeline are basically ever schematized the data streams backed by Kafka. They are essentially Kafka streams. And uh, it, become of the, it becomes the source of truth for most of our data sources. For example, our MySQL data are stored in data pipeline. Our derived data and signals are also written to the data pipeline. And our partner data are also written into the data pipeline. So this provides us a clean interface to retrieve all the data sources. And uh, for data pipeline, we have a unique schema ID for each data pipeline stream. We have a series of blog posts about our data pipeline in our engineering blog posts. And uh, if you are uh, interested about this, you can check out them in our website. Okay, uh, so for the Flink app, it has three components here in the single Flink app. The first is uh, Flink consumer. They are basically Kafka consumer, which consume data from our uh, data sources. And then the Flink consumer will key the, doc the data based on the document ID to the Flink processor. The Flink processor maintain a Flink state of each document. So instead of write do partial update of to the Cassandra table, we write all the relevant field into the Flink state, which is backed by RocksDB. And uh, in the Flink processor, it will query the entire document from the Flink state, and also flush the document into the Flink ES sync. So here, as you see that in the previous graph, we used a single Flink app. Uh, Flink app instead of, instead of multiple indexing components. And then we use the Flink state instead of the external database to for all the partial updates and the materialized view of each document. This is not too much different from the previous design, but, it, but we just use a single Flink thing to, to replace the multiple components in the original design. This largely reduced our complexity to modify or decommission our launch, our indexing pipelines since it's only a single app and this allows us to generate a unified API to uh, maintain all, our system, uh, all of our pipelines. Uh, yeah, unified API. As we mentioned, we want to make it uh, really simple for the, our developers to launch, aid, or modify our indexing pipelines. Uh, at Yelp, we have a centralized repo to maintain all our Elasticsearch mappings and settings. We have internal tools to keep track of this in centralized repo to deploy all these changes and the new indexes to our Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch clusters. So to make it simple to our developers, we add the indexing config in the same uh, repo. And the, here is an example of our uh, configuration. We have an index, we have a business index which has a location field and a name field. It's come, it's in, come from two data pipeline streams, schema one and schema two. And we define mandatory fields here to help us, which I will describe later. So in this single config, the user is able to uh, launch their index and also their index pipeline. And every time when they want to modify their uh, index in a new field, they can just Add a new field as long as the schema, which uh, is the source of the field. So a single place will do all the work for it. And for mandatory fields, it's something we define with ourselves. And uh, it's primarily used for two use cases. First, it want to, we only want to index the documents with all the mandatory fields. And uh, we, this is to avoid some incomplete documents in our Elasticsearch cluster. For example, if we don't want to uh, business without a name in our Elasticsearch index. We want the index to have all the required fields we have to show to the users. And it also helps our uh, helps to reduce the indexing load of our cluster. So this will re avoid every source update to become an indexing request, trying to get a better cluster load. And it also helps to handle the delete for multiple sources indexing. Since for multiple sources, we cannot delete the document based on a single uh, source. So in this case, we define the mandatory fields. We only delete document when any mandatory fields are missing in the Flink state. 
And uh, here is an example of our mandatory field. For example, we have an index which uh, has two mandatory fields, location and name. It has an optional field, which is photos. So we have a series of events coming in. The first event is an update of the location, which we don't, since uh, it, uh, the mandatory field name is missing, we don't do anything. It won't index to inter into our Elasticsearch. And then we got an update for photos. Still, the mandatory field name is missing, so it won't, we won't index to Elasticsearch as well. And then we when we have updated for the name, then we have all the mandatory field. When, at this time, we will index it. And when we delete the photo, photo field, since we still have all the mandatory field, we will just index the document with empty doc photos to our Elasticsearch. And when we try to, when there is a delete for the location field, we found the mandatory field, the location is missing. And uh, in this case, we will delete document from our Elasticsearch to avoid uh, document with other location in our Elasticsearch index. Uh, this is basically our indexing platform we built recently, and we have already migrated one of our primary indexing pipeline into this system. And then I will hand off to my colleague Karsik to talk about the get Elasticsearch Gatekeeper. Thanks, Tao, for giving us insights on how our indexing API has evolved over time. As Krishna mentioned, uh, the first meetup that we gave a while ago discussed extensively on how we built an Elasticsearch-based uh, system. So after we rolled out our initial use case of business search to this system, the next big goal or milestone for the team was to scale it up to multiple other teams within Yelp. Some of the use cases is request a quote, ads, uh, uh, multiple other search applications which could utilize the same learnings that we had on business search. Um, so I'm going to share a few challenges that we faced as we scaled an Elasticsearch-based system into a platform and how we have solved all of them. I'm going to break them apart into multiple different themes, uh, and we'll cover each of them as we go. The first big thing uh, that we had to face was the resiliency of the system. As, uh, as we were scaling to multiple logical clients within Yelp, you can imagine a system where you have an indexing client and a search client both going to Elasticsearch. But as you're scaling to a platform, you'll end up with multiple different clients trying to query Elasticsearch. The big problem here is uh, one of the challenges which Tao mentioned was the signals that we get from indexing can be bursty because of them coming from Spark jobs or other sources where there is no control on the throughput of uh, indexing requests that we get. The other challenge is uh, when you have multiple search clients, there is no control on how the client behaves uh, on top of your cluster. So the two challenges we saw was heavy indexing and search requests, we had no control over at what rate they were going to query or hit Elasticsearch. So when we had bursty indexing requests, we saw the cluster get overloaded, and that affects real-time search queries uh, that are serving live traffic. A few reasons why, why, because of which a uh, cluster gets overloaded is your thread pools get queued, but you're still sending more and more requests to Elasticsearch. The network gets saturated. The natural thing to try out is to tune thread pools on top of Elasticsearch, but uh, quick thing to note is when we change the configs for these thread pools, it's going to affect all the clients. And assume your cluster is already overloaded and is uh, having issues, you have pretty low control on recovering your cluster back. So the goal was pretty uh, simple. We wanted to throttle individual clients based on uh, certain conditions or SLOs that we set up with the client. This was in order to uh, not rely on the client to behave well on top of the cluster, which we could definitely try out. But in practice, even the clients may not always have control on how they are querying Elasticsearch. So to solve this goal, uh, we had explored multiple different options. The one which seemed to fit all of our requirements was an open source uh, repository from Netflix, which is Hystrix. Hystrix provides what we needed for a client level isolation. Um, in a sense, it's provi it provides two different types of isolation. One is the proactive isolation. You can imagine these are 
things you know early on about the client which you can use, which are things like you want to limit the request time each client takes. You want to limit the throughput of the client, which is uh, rate limiting each client separately. Netflix Hystrix also offers reactive isolation, which is, uh, in other words, called circuit breaking. Let's say there is one really, really bad client, which is uh, trashing your cluster. You don't want to send any more requests for the client, which means you are going to circuit break the client. But you don't want to keep doing this, but give it give the client a chance to recover or behave properly, which is uh, some of the things which the Hystrix API provides. A quick thing to note here is all these configurations are static, uh, so they are predefined and predetermined for each client, but this solved uh, all of our problems well. So that's what we did. We put a gatekeeper right in front of Elasticsearch to defend it from multiple different clients uh, as we scaled up our system. So a, a, a big feature of Hystrix that we found super useful was uh, rate limiting. Uh, rate limiting follows a pretty usual principle of Little's law, which is the limit or the throughput that you want the client to control is uh, dependent on two things. One is you would no have to know the average throughput requirement of the client as well as the average uh, latency. So for each of the indexing and search clients, we always knew these two things, the anticipated query rate that we should support for the client as well as the average latencies for the client based on their elastic search queries. Based with the knowledge of these two metrics, uh, we are able to control the resources allocated for each client. If there are excess requests from each client, it's up to the client whether they want to throw back a 500 or continue to retry. Let's say, for example, our indexing requests, if they fail via the gatekeeper, we want to continuously retry until the data gets ingested. A reason for that is not to have any data loss. So we follow a simple math on how many resources to allocate per client based on the knowledge of the two metrics. We need to know the peak QPS for every client and also the high P99 latencies. The reason we picked the peak metrics here is uh, to get the maximum resources we could allocate. We also throw some breathing room to the client uh, just in case some things on Elasticsearch are a little overloaded or some QPS uh, bandwidth is free for the client to uh, play with. So to get the max QPS, uh, this is kind of like a client knowledge where we have an anticipated rate. And for max latencies, we have some stress testers by which we can run Elasticsearch queries to get some initial metrics on P50s, but the thing we are curious to know is the P99s. Uh, as we have rolled Hystrix out, the big thing we wanted to do is make it as minimal uh, effort as possible for the clients to come and add their own heuristics on top of Hystrix. So we abstracted away most of the heavy lifting uh, into a base search command, and this is an example code on how new clients would have to write their own client in the gatekeeper. They just have to use two strings, which we will use in the static configuration. And this is pretty much all the thing we need for new clients on, in our gatekeeper. This is an example of the Hystrix configuration that we use. Um, there are a lot more configurations that Hystrix provides, but I've just taken the best ones and put it here uh, to share. The first four are, the first one is the request timeout, which is the proactive isolation that you have, I've discussed before. This is basically like how or what is the time limit you want to set up on the client. The next three are the circuit breaking, which is the reactive isolation that we want to try out for the specific client. The most interesting is the core size, which is kind of the rate limiter for the cool search client that we want to uh, provide. So the math here is if we know the cool search client is going to have 1,000 requests per second, and from test, stress testing, we know it's uh, going to have a P99 of 20 milliseconds. The maximum number of thread pools, which is the core size here, is 24. We threw some, a breathing room of four, four cores just in case. But as you can see, the core size is a derivative of two things. It's both request per second as well as latency. Let's say there are some changes in the client and it starts to pretend badly by being slow which is this case, the latencies went from 20 ms to 200 ms. This is going to limit the request per second for the client to just 100, 
rather than 1,000. Um, so clients have to be careful both from a QPS perspective as well as the query performance. Now let's say there have been certain discussions and we want to reduce and throttle the client further. We can uh, reduce the core size to 12 and that reduces the QPS to 500 MS. So the, this is just an example of how we take into account each client based on their requirements, try to tune the core size accordingly. Another big thing or big wins that we saw from the gatekeeper is we have developed it in such a way that it's just a very thin proxy bet uh, between the client and Elasticsearch. It does not intercept any of Elasticsearch request or response. All it does take care of is rate throttling and other configurations that here Strix provides. The clients are still responsible for query building and response deserialization. <laughs> other big wins are uh, we use Elasticsearch's low-level REST client within the gatekeeper. There are a certain things that we do within the gatekeeper, which is abstracting away complex logic like using a custom sniffer for discovery of coordinating nodes. For context, uh, Elasticsearch has different node roles. Uh, we have data only, which has bulk of the data, coordinating only, which takes care of uh, routing the request to the data nodes, kind of like scatter gather, and there are master only nodes. We implemented a custom sniffer for discovery of the, the coordinating only nodes. Uh, but the biggest win here is none of the clients which are querying the gatekeeper have to worry about the rest client. If there was no gatekeeper, each individual client would have to ha would have to implement this low level rest client and uh, take care of all the infrastructure underneath. After this, the clients have to only uh, query gatekeeper um, like they were querying Elasticsearch, but all the complex details are abstracted away. After implementing the gatekeeper, uh, we also saw another win, which is by assigning the threat pools or rate limiting each of the clients, we were in a way coming up with priority for each client. One example is, uh, let's say you have reservation data, which is kind of high priority that has to go into Elasticsearch. You can assign more resources for the high priority indexing client for say reservations data uh, while using a row priority indexing client for something more tolerable like batched indexing. We can follow a similar pattern on the search side as well uh, where we know the priority on certain logical clients and we assign weights to each of them in a relative fashion. The, sec the second big win that we saw from Hystrix was uh, once you have client isolation, it's also important that we track and monitor how the clients are behavi behaving in real time. So Hystrix already captures uh, client metrics at the client level. It uses a static rolling window to gather metrics uh, for each client. So the most useful ones that we saw were execution times, which is how bad or good their Elasticsearch queries are. There is also a total time which takes into account uh, whether there was any waiting time within Hystrix before it gets to Elasticsearch. There are also all the thread pool stats per client where we know how many rejected executions were there per client. So we know which are the ba bad clients which aren't able to keep up to the agreed upon SLOs. We also know if there are any requests timing out per each client. So Hystrix provides us Hystrix command metrics, which consolidates all of the uh, metrics that Hystrix captured in a static win in a rolling window. What we do is expose a servlet, which just reports all of this metrics uh, and shows it on signal effects. So if you have any third party vendors for reporting metrics and monitoring, uh, this is the right way to do. Have a servlet which wraps around Hystrix command metrics and uh, look at them in real time. The next big challenge that we had to uh, develop defense mechanisms around was uh, in terms of data scalability. Just to share a few stats about the scale of the data, we have millions of documents, which accounts to terabytes of data. As uh, we have discussed before, majority of our documents are constantly indexed, both because of real-time updates, as well as uh, machine learning signals that we generate. A quick primer again, like Lucene segments are immutable, so we mark the old segment, old documents as deleted, add a new document which ends up in a new segment. So as we constantly re-index, we end up with new segments all the time. So the initial idea we had was let's use 
one index for all of the data. The challenge there, as I've discussed, is we all will end up with more and more segments over time because of our indexing rate and refresh interval. We will end up with uh, many large segments potentially because Elasticsearch keeps keeps merging uh, multiple segments in the background. So the side effect of all of this is uh, our query performance and indexing performance slows down over time. And we eventually just see the cluster spending more time merging these segments uh, than actually doing real indexing or querying. So we considered multiple options, which I'll share here. The first option is, can we just split the index into more shards so that you have less segments per shard? But in practice, more shards is only going to scale up to a certain point. There'll, there'll, there's kind of like a soft spot where it doesn't scale anymore, but actually starts to dip. The reason being, there is more shards means more scatter gather and more bookkeeping. Um, so we have evaluated multiple sharding strategies, and we have observed there's always a soft spot per index where performance starts to not pay off. The second option was Elasticsearch provides merge configs, so we could uh, start looking into these merge configs and tune them. An important thing to note here is uh, the default max segment size is five gigs. Once a segment reaches five gigs, uh, Elasticsearch may not consider it for merging anymore. So as you tune merge configs, you'll either end up with a lot of smaller segments or end up with a few very large segments, both of which are not optimal for query performance. The third option is Elasticsearch provides you a force merge API where you can tell the cluster to merge all of the shards in your index into a predefined number. One is the best for query performance because there is only one segment to search for, but it puts a lot of pressure on the cluster to merge all the shards for, all, for the complete index. A quick thing to note is merging is pretty expensive from both the CPU and IO perspective. And this is especially worse, especially worse when the cluster is already serving live traffic. Another thing to note is if you're doing force merge, you have to put the index in a read-only mode uh, or else you'll end up with multiple segments, uh, which is not what you were aiming for. Say we were able to build a complex system which, where you have two clusters, where you do force merge on, the, on one cluster, switch the live traffic there. Um, while indexing to both the clusters. Such a system is pretty expensive to maintain and also hard to automate switching between the two clusters. So the path we chose to take was to have some domain knowledge to split the data into multiple indices. The biggest knowledge we have on business search, for example, is we know the location of the business both at index time and for every search, we know what the user wants to search for, like which specific location. So using the domain knowledge in both the query and at index time, we split the data into multiple indices. This is just an example of how we could split our data across the world. This example consists of eight different indices, uh, which takes into account what would be the resulting index or shard size if we were to split it in this way. A thing to note here is we are still using ES level sharding, which we termed as micro shards. This is uh, how Elasticsearch splits its index into shards. So you have a universal set of data, we split it into indices based on location data, and then we also use Elasticsearch to do internal sharding. Sharding definitely helps to parallelize your workload across different nodes and is very crucial for performance. Now, now that we know where to put the indexing, I mean, now that we know how to split the data, the big question is where do we put all of this logic in, which clients shouldn't be completely uh, burdened with. The gatekeeper seemed like a natural place where it keeps on a sorting hat, both at indexing and search time. It has the location data that, uh, in the, that is in the query uh, that is passed as URL parameters. So it knows which index to go to. The last thing is uh, how we have defended against uh, elastic search changes. As we have started rolling out infra to multiple clients and testing out different changes, we faced a common pattern that we had to solve. 
So we had to add like more superpowers to the gatekeeper. A few examples on wha what the superpowers does is we are able to do cluster upgrades. We are able to try out different application sharding like the one I've shown before. We are able to roll out uh, multiple elastic, sh elastic search sharding strategies like either increasing the number of shards or decreasing. We are also able to evaluate how how to, uh, we are also able to evaluate uh, new analyzers or similarities which are like breaking index level. All the index level changes essentially mean we have to re-index or backfill all of the data. So the backfill is required in all of these use cases. So we added this superpower to the gatekeeper which also facilitates querying different clusters based on different clients. We have termed, uh, at, at any point in time, we'll have two different clusters. One is the default cluster, which is already serving live traffic. And we set up an experimental cluster which, on which we will do some evaluations. This is just an example of the API that we have built within the gatekeeper. It's a YAML file which defines what is the default cluster, what is the experimental cluster. And we have three different cohorts on which we want to route a client traffic to. There are two ways we can do it. We can pick a specific client, say we want to route indexing client between the two clusters, or we want to roll out all the clients, which is the default command. So if you don't override a specific client, it'll take up whatever configuration is specified for the default command. So as I said, there are two different clusters, and I'll discuss what each of these cohorts mean. Status quo is how we want to, at what, what percentage of the query should be hitting the default cluster. Dark launch is what percentage of the query should be hitting both the default and the experimental cluster. But e even though it's hitting both the clusters, it's only gonna return results from the default cluster. So say queries are slow on the experimental cluster or something is broken on the experimental cluster, the live traffic isn't affected yet because it's still serving traffic from the default cluster. Live launch is how you want to shift traffic from the default cluster to the experimental cluster where users will actually see results from the experimental cluster. This is just a process that we follow on how we roll out these cluster evaluations. The first thing is uh, promising data consistency. So bulk indexing command is the client that we use for backfills. So this is a pretty lenient client in terms of rate limiting. We are able to aggressively backfill to a cluster because we know it's not serving any live traffic. So we launch the backfill at 100%. Then we have the real-time index command. We launch it at 100% because we don't want to lose any data that is going to the default cluster and not going to the experimental cluster. After the data is backfilled, we start rolling out and bumping traffic um, on the dark launch mode. We have a, we have a set of uh, monitoring dashboards which help us with how the query performance is looking between the two clusters. And we also have logs with the results. So offline, we can compare how the results are looking between the live cluster and the experimental cluster. Once we make sure the performance and results are OK offline, we start switching traffic to live. We start putting live traffic to the experimental cluster. For that, we use the live launch cohort, and we gradually scale up from a 1 to 100. We evaluate uh, search metrics to define success as we roll roll it out for live traffic. A quick thing to note about experimentation, uh, the framework that I've defined before helps with managing and evaluating all the infra changes on Elasticsearch. You could either do these infra changes on specific lines or across all the clients. There is also an AB experimentation framework at the service level at Yelp. We can definitely mix infra and service level changes but uh, an example of what service side changes for A-B experimentation mean is a service or a client might want to make query changes or recall changes or ranking changes. And the A-B experimentation framework helps evaluate how the metrics look for, for search. But we can definitely mix infra and service changes by creating more gatekeeper clients and using the A-B experimentation framework on the client side. So this is uh, a complete picture of what we wanted to discuss today. Um, if you're interested in solving similar problems uh, we are hiring, please reach out to us at uh, the end of this talk. Thank you.
Yeah, we can take any questions now. Uh, so what's the reason you store the click-through rate into the index time uh, in, in, in back to the index search? Uh, what's the reason why uh, you, inst you store the click-through rate, right? Just the one click or click-through rate. Why you put in the index? Mm. So that's just an example of one of the features we use for ranking. So for click-through rate, we have different click-through rate for each document. For example, it's we have a, it's example of our special signals, which is per document, different per document. And we have document like many millions, it's hard to store in memory. And uh, it's based on the result to used for rank used for rank for each document. So that's pretty much, pretty much the reason. So you were, you were talking about backfilling and so on. So generally, if let's say if you had to change your index schema, like you had a new field or you want to change some properties, then do you go back and fire your whole pipeline job again to recreate all, to start from all of the beginning of every Kafka stream and replay or something? And how do you do that without breaking your existing uh, searches which are still going on through the live index? I mean. Sure, so in Elasticsearch, you can see you can never drop a field. You can only add a new field. So every time if you are rolling out some new things, you need to first add a field in the Elasticsearch schema, and your application code won't use that data first. And in our indexing pipeline, we are able to, uh, in our flink state, if you are adding a new, new source, we are able to add the source and make, only make that source backfill from the beginning, not all the topics. And uh, so only that source is not, that source, that field is not used, and uh, once the data for that source is catch up, then we start to use that field. So there won't be any breaking changes during the backfill for that field. So the unified API that we build is uh, kind of, can evolve. Like as we add more schemas, we add the specific field and the schema, and the data starts flowing through for that specific field as well. But say there is some schema with all of the data, uh, we are able to still rate throttle how it flows into Elasticsearch. But we are only indexing those documents that have that new message. Hey, thanks for your talks. Um, so a question about the gatekeeper uh, that you mentioned. Um, so I understand the functionality there is to essentially throttle the client access, um, both read and write um, access to your data store, right? And right now the data store is Elasticsearch. So I wonder um, how easy it is to generalize the gatekeeper to other data stores, including, for example, Cassandra or Mancash. And do you see the possibility of building that out? Thank you. Yeah. we. It's definitely extensible for other data stores as well. Uh, at Yelp, we have other proxies for Cassandra, MySQL as well. We, I believe, have rate limiters set up in those proxies as well. But uh, I, I don't see anything, any hindrance for adding that to the gatekeeper as well. But we can definitely support. Uh, all it takes is adding those REST clients to the gatekeeper and tying individual clients to the data store that they want to query. Yeah, there, there's also that additional complexity of like setting up the the client logic needed to connect to a new data store. So I mean, the connectors themselves. So I mean, yeah, it's definitely something that we can look at, but I don't think it's like um, something that we're actively looking at in the near future. <coughs> Any other questions? So by biasing the traffic to some clients, um, it seems to me that it might affect performance in, in some ways, as in like 
you have higher QPS to some types of queries and lower QPS to others. How do we make sure, to, how do we monitor it? And uh, like, the, how do we know that the P99s that we decided on at the beginning are really the real ones eventually when we were in production? So if I understand the question correctly, uh, there are two different questions. One is how do we make sure the clients don't increase their latencies? So the thread pools that we set up uh, kind of tackles that. Like even if the latencies are increasing for the client, they will start seeing rejected, ex rejected execution exceptions. So that's a signal that something is wrong with the client. And we have dashboards set up to show what went wrong. Is it the timing or the QPS? Say we actually still want to support the client, um, it's actually going to be easy to take an informed decision because as we want to throw more bandwidth at the client, that means we have to also scale the Elasticsearch cluster behind it. But it's only gonna make that decision easy because we have metrics backing how the cluster is behaving or the gatekeeper is behaving. But uh, we have had similar cases and it's just easy to take an informed decision on let's scale the cluster up by X percent to support this client. Any more questions? Great, well, big thank you for Yelp for hosting that, a big uh, thank you for the speakers tonight. Uh, not only is Yelp host, uh, looking to hire as well, but just to make it easy for anyone looking for a job. Anyone in the audience looking to, for a job that they want to put their hand up so that uh, Yelp and other uh, companies who are looking to hire can find you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Also, uh, just one announcement. The next Wednesday onwards, uh, Scale by the Bay conference is happening in Oakland. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, please look it up. It's a very, very good community-driven uh, conference here in San Francisco that's been running for seven years. Uh, the organizer of the conference, whilst the talks were going on, actually, I posted the detail, the, 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 this, tonight's meetup on Twitter. Uh, and then the, 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 the conference owner actually uh, sent me a text saying, can you offer everyone there a discount code in case they want to go? So the discount code is meetup20. It'll get you 20% off the entry fee. And I believe they're still looking for volunteers to help with the conference if you want to get a free pass. Uh, so take advantage of that. If you forget the code, message me. Other than that, uh, this is probably our last uh, Elastic Meetup for 2019. See you all in 2020. Uh, there may be a uh, the possibly um, uh, kind of like a happy hour we may arrange if I can get enough sponsors before 2020, but it's not confirmed. So I don't want to get your hopes high. Other than that, have a great evening and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.